you know the funny part? It was all about data. Yes, there is a pretty UI on top, but it is the data that makes that UI intelligent. Um, if you haven't, I strongly encourage you, I'm a big fan, read the, uh, read blogs from Brett Victor. Uh, Brett Victor was a UI designer in Apple. So he designed uh, the interface for the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad. A uh, real guru in its right. But if you read his blogs, you see he's always talking about the UI being predictive. Can you do things with data that then you can infer and then show the user what he would want? Uh, to see and he doesn't know yet. Uh, so all of Apple's UI, you think it's so pretty, but it's not the pretty aspect. It's just that there is something in front of you that you want already. So let me illustrate the problem that we are going through uh, from an e-commerce perspective. So here's the back, you know, Amazon, Jabong, eBay, um, Flipkart, take your pick. And uh, there's a bag that's uh, going to be sold. So there's a page that is a bag. Um, there are lots of parameters on this page, but primarily, you know, as a shopkeeper, so as an online retailer, you see that, yes, I'm selling a bag. There's a bag page. So you take Amanda, who's uh, coming to the site. So let's take four characters. Now, Amanda is going to come to the site. What do you make of Amanda? You can't see her. What do you say? Okay, Amanda is a bag visitor. She visited the bags page. Okay, and then you show her uh, an ad, which is very generic. Uh, something that says, best deals on bags online, check out these bags. Right? So if Amanda has come to your site once or twice, you then bombard her with these ads. So all the ads that you're seeing on Facebook or Google or even Times of India or Yahoo, uh, oh boy, you don't want to know how, uh, how much uh, of research is done behind showing you the best app. You as users, uh, we all as users, uh, everyone out there in the ad tech world is trying to make the best app for you at that point in time. And so here, if you just capture the fact that Amanda is a bag visitor, all you can get is a boring ad like this. Now let's say they are Betty, Carla, Dan, all of them bag visitors. Again, same old boring ad. So at the end of the day, there is no personalization. Remember the whole uh, uh, talk about how a real shopkeeper deals with things? Just disappeared, gone, right? And so many times you are irritated by those ads that just say the same thing. It's the same old, same message, exactly same looking ad displayed to everyone. Let's learn from the gurus at Coke. So this is probably 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, so a lot of things, you know, uh, if you think of online and we think we are at the cutting edge, a lot of this has been solved uh, problems 20 years ago, 30 years ago. You've just got to look in the offline world. Um, uh, so in uh, at Coke, um, Coke has built one of the most phenomenal brands out there. And uh, what they did was, you look at these two ads and tell me how different they are. So this first ad here says, share Coke with Kate. And it's all about giving. It's about uh, saying, do stuff with your friends. It's about altruism. It's evoking certain emotions in you that... Um, uh, say share with someone. It's about thinking of you within your friends. The other ad here says, think about it. Man set foot on the moon because he wanted to set foot on the moon. Right? It says, it doesn't matter what the world thinks. It doesn't matter who's around you. You want to cook, you get it. Right? That's the power of saying, indulge in it. So when Ashwara Raya rules it, says, you're worth it. You know, it's about you. It doesn't matter what others say. It doesn't matter what your in-laws say. It doesn't matter what your husband says. It doesn't matter what your boyfriend says. You are worth it. You better buy that necklace. You better indulge in that um, uh, glorial cosmetic and so on. So that is the spirit of saying self-indulgence. This is saying altruism. So if you haven't seen, you know, there are a lot of uh, theories. So at Software TV, we intersect the words of psychology as much as we do ad tech and as much as we do data analytics. Why? Because not one field alone is going to solve this puzzle. It has humans in the loop at the end of the day. So what this teaches us is there are different ways in which you can approach the same person. Again, pointing to the bottom line of you need to know whom to sell to. Uh, you absolutely need to know how to sell. So what we just discussed about Coke was how you are selling it. Uh, you need to know when to sell it. 
you know, if I'm in a meeting and busy and you're showing me an ad, it's just not going to work, right? Um, so you need to time it right. And with mobile phones now, you can time it down to the last level of detail. Think about it. Your mobile phone has so many sensors. If I have an uh, accelerometer there, I know if I'm uh, moving, I'm walking, uh, I'm stationary and so on, right? Uh, the whole Google traffic product uh, was built around GPS dots. You know, what can you do with GPS dots all over the world? You have timestamps, so then there were half the GPS dots that were static. We said, oh, those are probably static locations, so people are sitting there. Oh, maybe those are offices. Then we saw GPS dots that are moving very fast. We said, hey, that's probably cars. Uh, then the GPS dots that are really moving very slowly. Now we're like, oh, maybe the cars are going slow. No, maybe not. The people walking. So if you have a lot of people walking, maybe it's a mall, maybe it's a residential area. So in maps, right, even though it was maps, what I was actually doing was trying to figure out, make sense out of data. You think of malls and think of entry and exit gates. It's a nightmare getting that data. How do you get data for malls and entry and exit gates? Um, the only way was looking at, can, are all GPS dots entering through one point, you know, within a few meters? Are all GPS dots exiting up, uh, at one point? Boom, you got your exit and entry gate. So you have to be very smart about data and with the current technology, the amount of data that you have is pretty, uh, 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 quite a lot. So when to sell, you can time that, right? Just yeah. one question I had uh, regarding the maps example, uh, does uh, Google also use that to crowdsource traffic, yeah. traffic condition? Yes, yes. So the question is, does Google use that data to crowdsource traffic condition? Absolutely. So uh, that is how Google traffic is formed. And uh, one of the nightmares we had on traffic was, and you can read about it on the Google blog as well. Um, in India, uh, there are no speed limits, right? So when we first trained the traffic set for India, we had a speed limit of 60 and uh, we said okay 60 is normal and uh, 20 is slow and 40 is this and Indian traffic just uh, varied. So even if it's 20 kilometers per hour on that Indrayanagar road in Bangalore, it's awesome. It's like super fast. Uh, so we had to mark that green. Uh, those are the kind of challenges. It's interesting. I used to uh, work very close to that and it was so accurate that <laughs> you used to tell me like Getting on the bridge, there's a block, and getting nice. down from the bridge, there's a block. But uh, on the bridge itself, it was green, which means once you enter the bridge, it's really accurate. That's why yeah. I was like, thank that. you, thank you, great. Uh, so it was very accurate, and uh, funnily enough, yeah, I would test it in that area. I would stay there as well. Oh. So, uh, uh, so these things, right, become extremely important, and they're not impossible. So even though you have a lot of this kind of data. Turning it into something that actually you can understand is not that impossible in today's age. Um, so let's look at example of, of how to do that. Literally at any point in time, you could probably have about 150 signals around the user. Uh, and these are pretty much anonymous signals. You know, you don't have anything very personal. You don't have personal info, right? All you have is a click stream. But based on what is being browsed, what is the price of being uh, uh, that is browsed? Just like the Adidas example, right? You are able to paint a picture. I'll give you a bunch of examples of how we do this. So uh, the first one, whom to sell to? Whom to sell to? Let's say Amanda came to the site, and what she actually did before getting to the back page was she went to the trending items page. Uh, what she did was sort here. She sorts it by new and popular. You know, often this is a very important signal on a website. Uh, does a person sort or not? And uh, if you look at these kind of signals, you say, okay, she's sorting by popular, she's going to the trendy page, what what, do you, what can you make out of this? And that's all we know about her, right? Uh, we don't even know her name, there's a fictitious name. Uh, so what we can say is this person likes trendy stuff, she wants to be popular, she wants to uh, have the, the latest dress in town, uh, that's kind of our uh, persona. Giving you some numbers here, so if a person sorts, you know, uses a sort on an e-com site in the last session, the process, the probability that they would convert in the next session, they would actually buy something in the next session, goes up from about 9% to 14%. So if a random person comes and is, uh, uh, is not sorting, uh, average, um, you know, depending on the data set here, we are, uh, you know, uh, this was a combination, but this was about 
3 to 4 million cookies, about 20, 30 million events uh, on a 3 node Hadoop cluster took about 2 to 3 hours. Uh, so not a very exhaustive data set, but uh, gives you an idea here. So um, for every user, for every signal, literally for every type of signal, you would see some of this, um, uh, some of this correlation. So Amanda here, you can classify her as a trend follower, and we'll see next how to actually message her. Second, let's see this Carla. And Carla uh, looks at deals, you know, ten dollars off. She would always sort by price or she'd or sort by discount. Um, so there's always discount side, you know. You must have noticed in all these e-com sites nowadays, you have sort by discount, sort by offer, sort by price, sort by popularity. Uh, just amazing stuff, right? But that one answer is totally giving away your whole persona right there. Uh, now that is used to show you the best product so that you can get what you are looking for quickly. Often frustration of online shoppers is I can't find what I am looking for. Uh, so when you have things like that, uh, if you look at uh, these guys who are looking for discounts, hungry for discounts, often they don't care about what site they go to, they want the discount. And with cash on delivery you, you can be doubly sure, like okay, no problem. I got up data there. Uh, in fact, now sites like Mintra and all are offering trials. Like, would you like to try this before you buy? Like, of course. And uh, so they're making it really easy. It's amazing the level of service that we are now getting in India. So, um, if you look at frequent buyers like these, if you have someone tagged in your database as a frequent buyer, uh, you often uh, can see a three x jump in conversion rates. This is very obvious, uh, you know, if someone has bought once or bought, keeps buying twice. Often strategies of e-commerce companies in the initial days are to get the first time buyers and then how do you turn these first time buyers into repeat customers. That's why lifetime value becomes very important metric here. Um, if you think of it, uh, say kurtis, right, uh, uh, kurtis are uh, uh, the first item that a new e-commerce buyer, buyer buys. Uh, uh, mostly females and uh, the average price rate for this first buy is about 300 400 rupee kurti that is the first buy but once a female buys a 300 to 400 rupee kurti and hopefully likes it she's going to spend 6000 rupees in the next 6 months so uh, those correlations vary a bit from site to site but there are these correlations and so how do you do the math you basically say oh if this person, do you say this person is worth 350 rupees because she bought that first kurti 350 rupees? No, you say this person is worth 6000 rupees. Now to market to that person, I am willing to spend 1000 rupees or take 2000 rupees, I am willing to get this person. So essentially what you end up doing is you are spending 2000 rupees to get that first purchase of 300 rupees. It's a massive loss for you for that first sale, but you are hoping that the lifetime value will uh, work for itself. So that is the kind of math that you have to do and this varies by site. Uh, I'll get into some challenges on the technology front that we face in terms of trying to uh, deal with this where models are always different. So uh, this person that we just talked about, she is a deal hunter. Uh, so classify that person as a deal hunter. Then you have Betty. So Betty comes and looks at all the brands. She's very picky. Uh, she knows the latest in brands, extremely brand conscious. Um, Often you would also see, uh, you know, there are two kinds of people that we see on ecom. One that just go for what they're looking for. They're looking for that blue, dark blue, braided, some accessory, and they just go for it, buy it, in out within two minutes, they're done. Uh, they're not brand conscious, mind you. They are more. They're looking for something very specific. The other, the other, the other kind where we did some, uh, uh, we keep doing this analysis where we found. Hey, people that look for brands are searching for brands are also sorting by discount. Now, what does that mean, right? You are willing to buy a Calvin Klein jeans and you are now looking for discounts on it. It doesn't quite correlate. But if you really think about it, it does. Statistically, when we saw that, we tried to dive into it, ask users. You know, people want to show off that big brand and get it at the cheapest price. You know, who doesn't want it? Why? Because Calvin Klein, no, but a brand, somebody is wearing that, oh, oh they go, Karina Kapoor or something like that. Now suddenly you want to match Karina Kapoor, you don't have the money to do it, but you look for a discount. Uh, so it's basic human behavior. So data tells you a lot of these stories, 
that you pretty much won't uh, otherwise imagine. So when you think of site search, you know it's a very important uh, signal there. Think of anybody who has searched the site, search within the site. This is not searching in Google. Uh, this is coming to the site and then searching within the site for something specific. Uh, the conversion rates here definitely go up. Uh, the conversion rates here literally from about 8 to 9 percent to about 14 percent. Uh, you'd see a direct 2x jump. When we often ignore these little signals, the person is willing to search, the person is willing to look at. Um, so this person is a fashionista. She knows her brands, uh, depending on the high-end brands, right? It's not about one or two brands, she really knows the very niche brands. Every brand there is a niche. There will be always a niche one, very expensive. Um, uh, so in New York, you know, there will be a couple of brands that are useful and so on. The last one, Dan. Um, so Dan, you know, he does certain things like on the shopping cart, he always checks gift wrap or he would end up saying, okay, give that one rupee donation. You know, these kind of guys are very altruistic in nature, often gifting items, often gifting items for uh, uh, friends, family and so on. Uh, you'd find a category of these items, folks that are repeat buyers because they keep buying for others. But this person is um, often spends a lot of time on the site as well. So time spent on the site, so beyond these signals, you know, whether the gift wrap was checked or not, very great signals to look at. But uh, if you also look at the times they spent on the session, uh, in the session, less than 90 seconds, you would have an average conversion rate of about 6%. Uh, you would have less than 10 minutes if they're spending on the site. You won't see a bump up in conversion rate, so you know they've gone up from the one and a half minute and now it's looking at around say seven, eight minutes of a session. Um, you bump up the conversion rate to about nine percent. Then as more and more time comes up here, so an hour on the side, probably ten percent, then it kind of plateaus. So the guy who really want to buy is going to buy in about that eight to ten minute time frame. Um, the uh, this guy you tag him as a generous soul. So instead of at the end of the day you have back visitor, back visitor, back visitor, now suddenly we are a little more informed about who came to our site. Right? That's how you deal with data and do this with data. You try to form those signals from data. Now, the next part. Okay, you know about this person. Now you know exactly what they are looking for, how they behave, what they want to buy. Now the question is how to sell. So how to sell depends a lot on the messaging that you use in your app. So let's take example of Facebook ads. So Facebook right hand side ads. Um, Amanda was a trend follower, you want to give her messages such as everyone's buying these. You know it's a trend, you want to showcase that trend. Everyone's buying these Amanda, what are you doing? So bright colored sling bags that are a fashion must. You use these terms, fashion must, everyone's buying these. So at the end of the day, these also end up as templates. So what we have are all of these ads coupled with these personas, there are templates, add templates for every type of person. So there may be, you know, hundreds of personas for each type of persona. And actually there are some, there's some research in psychology, there's a Leo Burnett framework which says there are no 200, 300 types, there are only 8 types. So the eight fundamental behaviors that any one of us can get classified in. Uh, and this has been a long drawn, you know, uh, long lasting thing that brands use very heavily. So we've also tried it with that and it works pretty well. So you take eight types of personas and you say eight templates that I'm going to create for ads. Now at the end of the day you want to do creative analytics. So what type of creative work for what type of persona to sell what type of product. So this is a machine that we have keep churning day in day out to ensure that the right product gets to the right guy at the right uh, price. For the Karma the deal hunter, you have something that it's 40% uh, off on some big brand. So deal hunters always correlate with brands, so throw the brand also, make them happy. You're getting a good brand at a low price. Uh, that works very well in terms of ads. Uh, the fashionista, you want to throw names uh, of big bags. So let's say in India you would have say uh, bags for high design. You know, slightly more expensive, 3,000, 4,000 rupee bags uh, start at that. And uh, uh, the typically someone who's very picky, uh, someone who really knows fashion, someone who knows what's going on in the ramp there. And lastly, Dan, 
you want to showcase others so shower her with love gift her this so all of these kind of uh, messaging and it can be used for people who fall into this gender soul type of bracket and literally there are uh, over a hundred such persona that we've created over the past uh, couple of years on this now you have uh, what you get at the end of the day is um, these templates and I tell you how much it matters for the same product so if you take earrings right you want to sell earrings and the first reaction is okay earrings I'll sell to females and uh, but 70% of people buying online are males what do you do with that so you say no no I'm just going to take 30% females and then what do you do uh, for females you say this this earring was made for you indulge in it you have to get this this is the latest in fashion or design and so on but one tweak that we did we said okay let's try males for a change with males that's not going to work but what is the messaging you use you target married males say 32 to 38 and you say when, when is the last time you gifted your wife something works brilliantly so it's messaging at the end of the day that turns the entire tables in terms of even if you have the right target audience you have that same married male whom you would have said oh buy this necklace it doesn't work but if you say when is the last time you gifted your wife something bingo works so uh, all of this analysis helps in actually getting uh, the right message for the right person so four different messages for four different types of people and of course this expands into uh, multitudes here then coming to some uh, real world examples of when to sell when is very important um, so the best example I can uh, you know, think of here is um, at the Super Bowl last year or was it the year before last uh, there was a power cut so Super Bowl is this massive World Cup cricket equivalent in the US um, and uh, the ad slots are really really expensive the whole marketing that goes behind it goes into the billions of dollars lights went out or the game stopped you know what twitter uh, what oreo cookies they tweeted they said lights out no problem you can still dunk in the dark and that one tweet right literally within an hour of this getting sent 15,000 uh, twitter retweets 20,000 facebook likes it just went viral getting things viral often hinges on timing so timing has to be right you have to capitalize on that timing and no better example than uh, this one in fact at the end of the super bowl they said you know whoever blah 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 won the game but oreo really won the entire cup uh, because they marketed it so well the way we use timing is still i'd say um, in its infant days um, there's so much to be done on timing, you know, precisely timing it when you're getting out of the building, ideally, uh, precisely timing it when you're, uh, you know, about to see something, about to um, uh, embark on a new task or you're during your downtime between two events that you're doing. Uh, but so far, you know, things like booking flights, you see a pattern in person booking flights, you say, oh, 25th of every one month, this person books flights. So maybe he books, does he book business class, first class, does he book regular economy, uh, does he book um, with one child or does he book uh, you know, three at a time or does he book always one. Um, a lot of this tells you whether he's a corporate traveler or a personal traveler. If he's a corporate traveler, you want to then, uh, you know, then time it right. You want to say discounts coming, you know, save your company money and so on on the 24th. Uh, you kind of find that pattern. You also say, uh, you also see a little spike around the 1st to 5th or 7th of the month when people have their salaries, youngsters, right? No responsibilities, lots of money in the bank, working in IT, uh, you get your salaries and blip, uh, you know, buy some electronic gadget. Um, so that's normal. So when would you market to a young IT professional? Not on the 28th, not on the 29th, but on the 1st, but on the 2nd, right? When they actually have that money. Um, so timing at this level uh, definitely works and uh, works brilliantly. Other one, uh, you have retailers. You know, you think of seasons and you teach kids. So seasons, you know, summer, winter, rainy, and three seasons. But in the shopping world, uh, then no less than you know, 13 to 20 shopping seasons. Uh, they've turned everything into a season. Uh, back to school sale. Now uh, monsoon sale, and every little event is a sale. 
सो यू हैव टू कैपिटलाइज ऑन दैट दिस सीजनैलिटी नीड्स टू बी कैप्चर द रीजन आई एम टॉसिंग ऑल ऑफ दिस की कोरिलेटिंग एट टू द मशीन लर्निंग प्रॉब्लम एट हैंड नाउ यूर सेल्स आर गोड टू वेरी बाय द सीजन बाय द मैसेजिंग यू पे बाय द टाइमिंग दैट यू पे बाय द प्रोडक्ट दैट यू आर सेलिंग टू होम यू आर सेलिंग so the number of parameters here right across domain these are very very disparate parameters that correlate to make that sale happen or not and varies by client so uh, the way a discount site behaves is very different so the way a groupon would behave uh, that is around coupons uh, would be extremely different than the way a flipkart or a jabao would behave because there are very different types of people coming to that those two different sites Uh, how do you correlate that? So literally, there is no one grand machine learning algorithm. So from a technology point of view, uh, uh, there are challenges in terms of how do you keep training models for different uh, clients specifically. Um, you can't just aggregate data, and then there is no uniformity across these signals across uh, clients either. Uh, so that's not an option sometimes. Then coming to the uh, one of the most important parts, which is what to sell. So we said, okay, we're selling that good, we're selling that bad. But if you really think of it, what to sell? Uh, the best example is, uh, you know, I don't drink, but uh, whenever I go uh, with some friends to Hard Rock Cafe, um, I'm the designated driver. But there, there is how many of you have seen this holster guy at Hard Rock Cafe? Anyone here? The people in our office very big fans of this guy. So uh, there is this guy with a holster. Uh, holster is where you carry guns, right? Uh, something like this, and he has tequila shots in it. He has those shot glasses in it, and his job is to figure out if anyone is going slow on the drinks, uh, or not drinking enough, or not ordered enough. His job is to upset. He just walks there and says, he makes a big noise and says, shots anyone, and just takes out two shots. Boop boop. Uh, just looks like a cowboy. Uh, brilliant experience, and exactly the product that you would say quickly yes to. And ends up being one of the more expensive prices and things on the menu, right? Uh, so, um, what to sell at that point is extremely critical. Um, there are complete examples of this. So, the way we use what to sell signals are: if someone's bought a coupon or someone's bought something around gymnastic, uh, uh, gymming. So, somebody bought a coupon for gymming. You know what? Everyone buys after buying gym. They uh, or gym membership. They buy shoes. Why? Because many of these gyms have rules, so you have to have separate shoes that you come in and separate shoes inside the gym. Uh, or for some reason, you just want to refresh your life. Okay, I've joined the gym, I've paid that money, now I have to go because I paid the money. And now what else can I get? Okay, I'll get uh, nice expensive shoes, and you go with it. So a person has to be followed with what product to sell next. You can't say I sold this product to the customer and I'm done. Great, I sold, I'm happy. You have to find the next one. A traveler, the tra person buys flights. How irritating are those ads that show you? Oh, flight to uh, Maldives, flight to Maldives, flight to Maldives. They go there, bought, bought the ticket a month ago. What are you doing? Uh, instead, show him hotels tomorrow. Hotels in Maldives. Show him uh, discounts on some buffet lunch in Maldives. Uh, nice cruise there. So you have to keep upselling on different things. An interesting correlation we found was. Dinner for two and all these kind of coupons have an immediate correlation with you know something as silly as dental floss, dental checkup. Uh, so uh, you're going on a date, you really want to look your best. Uh, the worst thing you want to have is bad teeth, bad breath. So that is dental floss. More true in international countries, uh, the correlations are really huge. So um, even this is not limited to e-com and all. Uh, I am made it. How many few fans? So Iron Maiden fans, right? Uh, Iron Maiden had a company, Music Metrics, in the UK, actually run through analytics. So they were broke; they were not doing really well. And um, now it's arguable whether they commissioned it or somebody else that did this uh, data mining and gave it to them. But nevertheless, this data mining was done. What they did was they looked at uh, BitTorrent data to find which countries, which cities were there. Songs getting downloaded the most, so they were facing rampant piracy. They were, uh, you know, they're not making money out of it. People loved them, but they were not making any money. What did they end up doing? Doing this analysis, they found out which cities is there uh, pirated, so pirated songs uh, are there pirated songs downloaded the most. 
they found places that they had not thought about, Sao Paulo and Brazil, uh, different places like these that they wouldn't have typically imagined. You would go to New York and go to uh, Chicago and so on, but here Sao Paulo and Brazil. Like sure, let's follow this trail. They actually followed this trail of cities that just were sorted by something as simple as BitTorrent IP addresses by location. And boom, they were one of the most successful, financially successful brands in the last decade. Uh, little little things like these, you just look at your top countries, your top locations, you know, you don't even need to dive into so much detail like did he click that sort by popular or not. Sometimes even a sort by location is all that it takes. Target had done this uh, many years ago. Uh, it had got mixed reviews because it was like, dude, what are you doing? This is too private information. Uh, but from a data mining perspective, what they did was pretty smart. Uh, so what they did was they had a registry of uh, uh, pay, uh, 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 females expecting a kid. And they said, okay, register for this registry. And then uh, they gave them some free voucher or gift card. And what happened was they kept buying things with that voucher. So suddenly Target had a list of shopping carts for that person. Um, if you notice, Big Bazaar is doing that smartly, or I don't know if it still exists, but they had that mobile phone recharge, right? Free recharge. You buy in Big Bazaar and then get free recharge on your phone. What it is essentially doing is tagging all your shopping cart purchases to one phone number. So a unique identifier for you. Um, it's pretty smart from a data and personalization point of view. So what Target did was said, let me take all pregnant female uh, shopping carts and run some mining on them. Let's see what comes out. What they noticed was patterns like unscented was a keyword amongst all their purchases. Unscented because I remember when uh, my wife and I were pregnant, she couldn't st stand the smell of anything too strong. It just happens in your first trimester and so on. So uh, you tend to buy unscented lotion, you tend to buy unscented soap, which is typically uncommon. You know, if you're normal, you want scented soap. You want something. Where well, here you buy unscented soap. So what they inferred was anyone buying unscented stuff is expecting a baby. Let us upsell them with more baby stuff. So while the whole part it worked, it just doubled or quadrupled their uh, baby item sales. Uh, uh, they basically started, uh, uh, people found it magical, right? Hey, I'm looking for this diaper coupon, it just came in the mail. So nice. Um, for most customers, it worked uh, great. And uh, this is something, shopping cart analysis, basket analysis there, works like a charm. Um, one last thought to, uh, on the product side, is you don't want to always bombard with products. You don't want to say, hey, this product, this product, please buy this product, buy this product. Um, you want to also engage with the person. So uh, today's sales is a, a complete journey uh, across things. So you have search where you're, you're, you have intent. You want to quickly search for something. You have um, uh, Facebook where you're going to drive impulse purchases. You can never sell a TV on Facebook. You can sell TVs on search. You can sell a kurti on Facebook, you can sell accessories on Facebook. So impulse purchases versus intent purchases vary. And often it's a combination of these two. You can drive an impulse with Facebook, the person forgets about it, then slowly next time he comes on search and tries to search for that same item. So what you want to do is build a relationship with the person that the person keeps coming back to your site for more. So somebody who has bought something around food, you know, given an article, how to use a chef's knife for the first time. So if she's bought a knife, show her article about this. So get her more involved with your brand. This is another technique that works um, in building lifetime value with a customer. So overall you saw, you know, all of these four things you can derive with data, you can use with data. Um, it's pretty much in its infancy uh, to what it could potentially uh, uh, be. Um, it uh, really would be the uh, extremely personalized world that we would ideally want to live in. Uh, uh, so this is just a start. Now, I'll spend a few minutes on the technology part of it. Uh, all the focus of the talks has been business, but I uh, it wouldn't be right if I don't give you some scoop on the technology front. Um, we deal with about um, um, hundreds of millions of pixel fires. Um, every month in terms of um, uh, uh, 
you're into hundreds of terabytes of data, not yet in petabytes. So in the initial days, MySQL was okay. Uh, you you shard MySQL or you cluster MySQL. Um, all of that you keep because everyone knows MySQL, right? You try and most companies start like that. Your data MySQL easy. Uh, little update there, okay, Mongo, uh, when your data structures get messed up, so we use a lot of Mongo and MySQL and then uh, we started using Redis quite a bit for caching. Uh, now that stack worked well, a uh, couple years until we started seeing more and more data. So over the past uh, one year, we have literally gone from about 40 advertisers to 4000 advertisers. Uh, now not just taking the big guys, but also taking small guys, dentists, restaurants. Now, how do you manage 4,000, 5,000 advertisers, uh, you know, even semi-manually? Not possible. Has to be automated. So, as we get more of, more of, um, uh, have to handle more of, more, of the, uh, more and more of these things, automatically switch to, you know, storing a lot of this on, say, Hadoop, Hedgebase, running map reducers, uh, directly streaming side data on Hadoop, and even that's okay. Uh, works well. Uh, but we also started hitting uh, limitations on other fronts. So, for example, active MQ. Things that you don't think would break, start breaking. Active MQ, not very good at scaling. Uh, you, you are now uh, we are in the process of switching to things like Kafka. Um, so, Kafka is something that LinkedIn open sourced. Uh, a beautiful stack, a beautiful uh, message broker system, very distributed, works on scale. Active MQ uh, does well in terms of latency. Low latency and that's what you want for a message service, but uh, really uh, cries loud on throughput uh, after some point in time. Uh, the other thing that we realized was, as as we think of MapReduce, in fact you may have seen uh, words at Google also mention this publicly. Google doesn't use MapReduce for most of the things now. Uh, it's moved to Flume and Millwheel type of uh, systems. Now what's Flume and Millwheel? are equivalents of things like the strong topology, uh, the spark topology and so on. So uh, if you haven't explored, you know, we are in the process of kind of making that move, uh, exploring things, um, evaluating these, benchmarking these systems. The basic difference here is, you know, Hadoop is great for batched processes. But if you think of doing things when things are streaming, you have a clickstream coming in, you know, if you don't act in the next five minutes, the user is gone anyway. How do you deal with that? You want something that would process things when they're streaming. Uh, so Storm was invented by Twitter uh, and then open source. So Twitter did it for trending topics analysis. Um, so it basically tosses things in a bunch of what they call bolts, and it is uh, you know you pass from one to another, another to another, and process happens. So it is not the traditional map reduce way in which you would think, uh, but somewhat different in terms of uh, how you are able to deal with streaming data. Then come things like Spark where you say, oh, uh, Storm can only deal with only streaming data, Spark can deal with both streaming and batch data. So you can also correlate your streaming data with something that is uh, historically done or there is a batch process running on it. So these kind of differences, right, you start hitting the more and more real time that you get. Uh, the other challenge that we do face is, yes, there is a fancy machine learning algorithm and um, uh, great, we can run it on something simple on uh, say R or uh, in Java and so on, but you know, we want it to be really inherently running part of a MapReduce. Now if you think of say some initiatives like PMML models and all, uh, there are libraries that can be thrown uh, on Hadoop and you can run it part of MapReduce, but uh, I remember it was so simple at Google, why? Because Every possible data mining algorithm out there was rewritten in a MapReduce form and was available for use. So as an engineer, you never thought of it. You just said, I want to use LDA and it would be the most efficient implementation on a MapReduce possible. Now outside that doesn't exist, but uh, there are uh, uh, things that are needed there. We need to figure out how to make these uh, maybe not fully online learning, um, ideally yes, but at least batched online learning. So every two hours, every four hours, at least every day, can we retrain a model? Uh, can we make that uh, uh, so personalized uh, that it can continuously learn from the data coming in on a minute by minute basis? Uh, so a lot of gaps in those technologies that we are trying to now um, hunt out. If you, uh, you know, any, I'll take a couple of questions, we are out of time, but uh, 
strong, strong call here, a shameless call for please join software team. We are doing cool stuff, we really want help. Uh, if you like machine learning, we want to jump to the next stage. We want to skip this whole Hadoop uh, part and uh, you know, instead of reinventing Hadoop, uh, trying to fix things there, we want to jump to the next level there. You have seen Google's data flow, uh, there is Amazon's Kinesis, uh, uh, data pipelining on Amazon, uh, pretty powerful systems uh, that we are trying, we are in the process of moving to now. So, uh, questions? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the great talk. So, two things. Uh, first of all, this is the first, this is the second time I've seen the first person. So long time, you know, first time, 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 uh, what if somebody comes for this 300 rupees one you said and then you try to sell to you spend 1000 rupees or 2000 rupees because somehow you have analyzed that by other that is she or he will be 6000 rupees yes 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 it might be available that that person might be upgraded in the system or maybe more than one yes and I to understand this because I am working on something which is I am going to actually have a high uh, rather in the loss right. How do you do it in this material? No, great question. So the question is, uh, you know, I am throwing out some assumptions and throwing out some learnings, but clearly there will be 10 people who don't fit this bill. Uh, you know, how do you, so you are going to spend 2000 rupees with the hope that this female will come back and spend 6000, but she doesn't. She just keeps hopping different sites and buys 300 rupee things. Uh, so how do you eliminate that person? Uh, no great way of doing that other than uh, uh, figuring out outliers around certain data. So, there will be certain uh, times and we are not there yet, uh, but there will be certain patterns in terms of the, um, uh, the one, one pattern I can tell you top of mind is the source that they come in with. So, if they come in through an affiliate click, what an affiliate is, is those clicks on blogs and website that trick you into going there, right? You are watching something else, you know, boom, something, suddenly something else comes up and you are on another side. Uh, or then it's free Wi-Fi. Free Wi-Fi, click three links and then you get free Wi-Fi. A lot of those uh, sites are called affiliates. So they get, you know, 2%, 1% of the sale value if you sell. And those are the ones that are these uh, one night uh, kind of things where they just come in, go and you're done and you never see them again. That, uh, those are the anomalies. So you have to figure out what signals correspond to those uh, uh, anomalies there. Uh, you have uh, anomaly detection uh, uh, even in terms of clicks. So negating what clicks are bad on the in the display world, there are a lot of bad clicks, fraudulent clicks, bot clicks. Uh, it's a whole world in itself for anomaly detection. So uh, 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 not sorry yet, Yeah. As you said, uh, uh, that India is a particularly user is doing this. So UI is helping you to get it. For example, you are helping your to get it. For example, you are asking certain questions. Yeah. Uh, like uh, there are more, more and number of drop downs created. Yes, yes. So yes, that yes. Uh, your data will be sorted out perfectly yeah. and you can get it. Yeah. So, as you said, uh, about uh, uh, 10 to 15, like uh, she is just puffing, uh, puffing around and she is not going to buy anything. Yeah. Why not put in uh, some UI? Uh, in order to classify these kind of users uh, and uh, uh, that can be helpful to the clients as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So one of the emerging branches of machine learning you would see is some people have an innate understanding of data and machine learning and at the same time have an understanding of how the UI impacts this. Uh, those are golden today. Uh, so typically you know there will be machine learning and even machine learning gods are very hard to find, you know amazing crowd here. Uh, but uh, you would at least find 100 people who know machine learning. You would find maybe two people who know a combination of machine learning combined with, uh, say, how it impacts UI, or machine learning combined with how it impacts business. Um, so definitely, these are exactly the areas to get into. I question also in regards to technology integration. So 
the technology that's built for it is very much applicable for even recommending products on the website and so on. Um, so we are in this phase of creating IP uh, that can then find a lot of UI that can uh, you know get out there as products, uh, but along very similar lines. I think we are out of time. Okay, last question. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, we generate uh, advertising text and red tag because it varies uh, from customer to customer. So I have a client on the Yes, so yes, yes, yes. We, we do, we do. So we do. Uh, so depending on the customer, sometimes, uh, you know, let's say HTML ads are on display. If your customer is viewing an ad. Uh, Maybe we don't have any past history of the customer, but what we do know is it is being shown on economictimes.com. Maybe we know that it is being shown in a Chrome browser. Maybe we know it's being shown with the screen resolution. Uh, maybe we know the background of the page is blue or it's white. Little information like this can be used to personalize it. You also need a social media uh, Not other than social media. Uh, so social media primarily Facebook. Facebook. Uh, so that is an FBX. So when you do Facebook exchange in real time, you could do that. Uh, the other one is around, uh, uh, primarily is around HTML ads on display. So when you have HTML ads, because HTML is so powerful, you dynamically fetch things on the server. Uh, so you render a container and then you say, now one line in this I want to fetch from the server that is personalized for this guy. Um, that uh, works as well. Alright, great. Thank you so much and I'm reachable at Rahul.com.